We continue in our lesson series on Wednesday days. Our goal for the summer, between now and the mid of August, is to equip you, the congregation, to stress less and to accomplish more. We're doing this with the help of the Scriptures, guided by the Holy Spirit. Our theme, though, is set by a book written by Pastor Mark, When the Day, Seven Daily Habits. The premise of the book is that there are seven things that as Christians we should be doing every single day. And if we do them, we will stress less and accomplish more. Now, the idea of when the day is not just new. It's in the Bible, but it's also in other literature, in other books. What is to win the day? I know it's a catchy phrase. I know it has different meanings. But what is to win the day? If nothing else, today we are not learning about a new habit. But we are putting the two first habits in sync. And we want to pay attention. I want your mind to slow down and to consider how you can win the day or what win the day even means to you. I want you to consider this question as we go through our lesson. To me, one of the first things that I consider is that God is asking me not to to bite more than I can chew. You have heard that before. Don't bite more than you can chew. Whether it's at work, with your family, children, while you are on vacation, when you try to overdo it. Last week, we were talking about how you can eat an elephant. You can only eat an elephant one chew at the time, one bite at the time. God is telling you today through the scriptures, for you to consider today. If you win each day, you don't have to worry about tomorrow. We are called to have faith and to trust in the one who is over all, in all, and living through all. So we don't have to. One of the biggest challenges for humanity is for you to try to control the things that you cannot, rather than trusting the one that guides all. Today, I want to encourage you to make the conscious decision to live life in day-tight compartments. If you worry about today, you don't have to worry about tomorrow. And of course, There's a part of us that wants to save for the future, who wants to save for retirement. And all those things are good. But in here, we're not talking about savings. We're not talking about money. We're talking about what is in your heart today. I want you to center yourself in the things of the heart today. You are responsible. It's something that we learn on habit number two. Here's the way. You are, you have the responsibility to control what is in your heart. To trust in the day-by-day faithful process rather than having a desire to control the outcome of every situation. If you're older than one, you understand that not every desire that you have will come and become a reality. We have to readjust our mindset. Why? Because if the devil cannot tempt you, he will keep you busy. Keep you busy about worrying about the future. In here. 
We are not going to consider today the lesson of the apostle located in 2 Corinthians chapter 6. And we will see how the apostle flip and kisses in his memory. First thing, though, I want you to consider and re-examine the words, our daily bread. When you say our, does it mean that it belongs to you or that God has made it available for you? Do you think that you deserve daily bread? Do you think that God owes you your daily bread? When you say our daily bread, is it ownership? Or is it that you are surrendering yourself to that which you are receiving daily? If nothing else, as humans, we receive a daily cross. That is truly yours. Would you take up your cross daily and follow Christ? Let us see how the apostle does this. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Beginning in verse 13. As God's partners, we beg you not to accept this marvelous gift of God's kindness and then ignore it. For God says, at just the right time, I heard you. On the day of salvation, I help you. Indeed, the right time is now. Indeed. The right time is now. Today is the day of salvation. Does that mean anything to you? Are you singing with joy? To hear the words that today is a day of salvation, does it produce joy, gladness? It should be. We live in such a way that no one will stumble because of us. No one will find fault with our ministry. In everything we do, we show that we are true ministers of God. We patiently endure troubles and hardships and calamities of every kind. We have been beaten, been put in prison, faced angry mobs, worked to exhaustion, endured sleepless nights, and gone without food. We prove ourselves by our purity, our understanding, our patience, our kindness, by the Holy Spirit within us, and by our sincere love. We faithfully preach the truth. God's power is working in us. We use the weapons of righteousness in the right hand for attack and on the left hand for defense. We serve God whether we people honor us or despise us, whether they slander us or praise us. We are honest but they called us imposters. We are ignored, even though we are well known. We live close to death, but we are still alive. We have been beaten, but we have been not killed. Our hearts ache, but we, have always, but we always have joy. We are poor, but we have spiritual riches to others. We own nothing, and yet we have everything. Oh, dear Corinthian friends, we have spoken honestly with you, and our hearts are open to you. There is no lack of love on our part, but you have withheld your love from us. I am asking you to respond as if you were my own children. Open your hearts to us. To God be the glory. 2 Corinthians is one of my favorite passages. It sees the evidence of the character of Paul, not because of Paul, but because of the spirit that lives in Paul, in God. 2 Corinthians chapter 6 is something that is a, serves as a testimony to my life when I'm struggling as a pastor. It is in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 that I see the glimpse of how the Apostle Paul puts to flip the script and kiss the wave at the same time. See, in the book that we are reading, there's two first habits to flip the script and to kiss the habit are called part one. It is the one of the seven, it's two of the seven habits that help you to deal with the past. 
to let dead yesterdays to let dead yesterdays die, or something like that is what he calls them. What's the name? Who has a book? What's the name? It's going to bother me if I don't find it. Say that again. Yes. Very dead yesterdays. Sounds like something I would say, actually. <laughs> the apostle acknowledges the difficulties of his journey, but delights in the wonderful things that he encounters. The apostle has flipped the script and kissed the wave, specifically in verses 9 to 10. Would you say this with me? Would you respond with the red hearts? We live close to death. We have been beaten. Our hearts ache. We are poor. We own nothing. Now let it read it backwards. You will read the black. I will read the red. But we are still alive. But we have not been killed. But we have always joy. But we have given spiritual riches to others. And yet we have everything. That's how you should be reading it. Where is the <laughs> of that in your life? We own nothing, and yet we have everything. Tell me if this doesn't belong in a movie. Right before the music goes and the slow motion activates, and you are moving into... And you hear the voice of whoever your favorite voice is. Mine is Morgan Freeman, of course. <laughs> we are still alive. We have not been killed. We always have joy. We give spiritual riches to others. And yet we have everything. We are not simply to survive, my beloved. We are to live in grace. See, memory is a blessing and can be a curse. Blessing when you dwell on the good things while acknowledging the bad, terrible moments in life. But memory can be a curse when you fixate yourself on the bad, terrible things that happen and you let go of your blessing. I have done this, so I know that you have done this. How do you speak to yourself matters. If there's anything I have learned from comparing this book to the Holy Scriptures is that I need to change the way I speak to myself, the way I speak to myself about others and to me. I need to read the Bible for me, not to apply it to others. I need to use my memory, count my blessings, and acknowledge the bad and terrible moments that are happening. It's not about being optimistical at all times. It's not about living in the clouds. It is about not letting go of the good life that you have already experienced. Or asking for more. Flips and kisses are demonstrated by the apostle. Look at all the things that he enjoyed, the company, and all the things that he has endured. If anything, as I was talking to a trusted friend, every letter that you see from the Apostle Paul, it looks like he's angry. He's always talking to the churches about it. Come on! You know this! What are you doing? Wake up! Come on! You know this. I want you to pay attention how the apostle interacts with the scriptures and how the apostle is asking us to interact 
with the scriptures. You are encouraged to explore. The book says to identify the lead measures, to identify the things that produces the results that you want. The goal is simply to establish daily rituals that empower you. To break bad habits by establishing good habits in your life. Begin with how you speak to yourself. Make that a habit. I love verse 7. I could faithfully preach the truth. God's power is working in us. Sure, there are two habits. To flip the script and to kiss the wave. To embrace what is coming to you and not speak neg- negatively about what's happening to you. But to say, how can I use this for the glory of God? Again, there is no purpose in suffering unless we give suffering purpose in God. Let me say it again. There is no purpose in suffering unless you take the suffering that you're experiencing, you give it to God and allow God to transform you in this moment. If you do that, you will stress less And you will accomplish more. Let us win the day. Amen.